another wave of people. All right, welcome everybody. This is the last week of lectures before Christmas break. And we'll resume in the new year, so uh, what we'll get done this week will excite you uh, for the material to come in the new year, I think. We're going to, after a period of philosophical lectures, uh, we're going to return to practical skills and learn new model types uh, and some new ways of plotting predictions for models. Uh, to remind you where we've been and where we're going, uh, in the first part of the course you uh, got an introduction to Bayesian inference, uh, then you acquired a bunch of skills for fitting simple Bayesian models. They were all linear regressions, uh, which is actually, as I keep saying, more than 95% of all applied statistics is linear regression. Uh, always wrong, rarely bested. Uh, and uh, remember the geocentric model? It's hard to beat it, but it's always wrong. It's just it's how it is. Um, and this week, we're going to uh, try to beat it. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you that it can be beat when you use the available information uh, in a savvy way. Um, what we're moving into now is to fully embrace this tide prediction engine metaphor that I introduced in an earlier lecture. To, to remind you, uh, statistical models are machines that process information for us, and the parameters are states of the machine, but they're not the predictions that we're interested in. The, the, and the, the states of the machine have to be adjusted so that the machine makes good predictions. But then reading the states of the machine is not actually what you want to do. Uh, what you want to do is read the predictions of the machine to understand what the machine is going to do and how it behaves. There's this temptation to gaze deeply at the, at the states of the machine, that is the parameters, as an interpretation. And in the simplest models, you can do that and get away with it. The simplest linear regressions with no interaction effects, it is typically safe to gaze at the gears of the tide prediction engine. This would be the bottom row. <laughs> down here and figure out what the tides will be because the machine is so simple and you're an expert All right, so you can do it uh, that time is over as of today uh, it was actually over last week with interactions it was already the case that you couldn't stare at the parameter values and make any sense out of the model uh, now it's really over uh, because we're going to move into generalized linear models uh, our goal will be to connect a linear model to some outcome variable which is not plausibly uh, normally distributed. What do I mean by that? I mean, we have additional information about the constraints on the variable before we've seen the actual values of the data. Just what we know about the measurement itself means that it will not be Gaussian. Uh, so if we use that information, we can do better. We can get more information out of the data about the underlying process of interest. Um, I, I quip here uh, that it would be better to ditch the linear model too, by which I mean if you had a real theory, it's unlikely it would look like a linear regression model. Uh, so that should be your goal, right? Every time you write down a linear model, I think we should be embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay to be embarrassed in public and science. That's basically what a scientific career is. It's a long series of public embarrassments, right? <laughs> uh, and that's okay. It's, it really is. Uh, but the linear model is a placeholder for a real theory. It's just an engine for measuring partial associations. Uh, and that a lot of good work can be done that way, but it's not a substantive theory. Uh, so we, I want to get that in here. Um, so the generalized linear model goal is to hook up a linear model to some other kind of distribution. Um, but that, this is just a stopping point on the way to a really good statistical model of a phenomenon, which gets rid of the linear model as well. Um, we're going to model multivariate relationships and nonlinear responses with these sorts of models. And these models are the building blocks of multi-level models. So we make multi-level models by hitching together multiple GLMs, actually embedding them in one another. And that's how you get multi-level models, hierarchical models, random effects models, grow out of that strategy. Um, measurement error models, lots of the other things we'll do in the new year uh, will we'll come from hitching together generalized linear models to one another in strategic ways. Uh, here's our strategy. I'm going to review these three points on the slides to follow. Uh, our first uh, step is we have to pick an outcome distribution. Then we model its parameters using what are called links to the linear models. Uh, and then finally, as you might expect, what is, our, what is our, always our goal in Bayesian inference is to compute the posterior. Right? There is one kind of estimator in Bayesian inference. Uh, one to rule them all it is the posterior distribution. Then you, can, you process the posterior distribution in lots of different ways to make decisions, uh, but the posterior distribution is a stopping point on the way to that. 
Okay, step one, pick an outcome distribution. The point of the uh, lecture on Friday uh, was to explain to you that there are principled ways to pick outcome distributions. Um, you don't have to use maximum entropy, but I strongly encourage it because it's a highly conservative, risk-averse way to pick an outcome distribution. It spreads probability as flatly as possible given the information constraints you believe you know about the variable. Uh, so uh, that strategy leads to, and that's, that's what chapter 9 in the textbook is about. Um, uh, and that strategy leads to all of the conventional choices uh, in generalized linear modeling. Uh, but it's not the conventional way to do it, right? It's kind of the physics way to do it. But it's, it's, uh, there are lots of other ad hoc ways of picking outcome distributions that produce the same choices somehow uh, because they turned out to be effective. I think that's a wonderful thing about uh, applied mathematics is that lots of different sets of axioms and points of departure lead to the same answer quite often, uh, which gives me pause to think that any of the perspectives is right, but other people <laughs> read it differently than I do. Um, so uh, if you're modeling distances and durations, these are outcome variables which are positive real values. Right? They're displacements from some point of reference. So you can think that they're zero or larger. Right? That's what durations and distances are. Uh, so when I say, what are the constraints on a distance and duration? If you told me you measured distances or durations, I know that all the values must be positive reals. Yeah? They have to be. Even before you've seen the data, that's, that's when you set, make this choice. You don't want to look at the values and say, ah, that looks like a something distribution. That's cheating. Right? That's, oh, that's, a, that's a recipe to overfit. Do something very bad. Uh, I call that histomancy in in the book. There's a snide overthinking box, a uh, rethinking box. There are a bunch of snide rethinking boxes in the book, right? There's one of them about histomancy, which I call the dark art of picking outcome distributions by gazing at the histogram of your outcome variable. That is a very bad, very very bad idea. Um, but it's taught, unfortunately. Uh, you've probably been taught it. Uh, you want to use information independent of the actual values of the data. Right? That's why you don't want to use the histogram. You want to use the constraints on the variable given to you by the way you measure it uh, to, to determine what a maximum entropy distribution would be. So with distances and durations, um, if all you know about a variable is that it has some positive average displacement, the maximum entropy distribution is exponential. Uh, I talk about this in the book. Um, uh, exponential distribution is, is, in some sense, the foundational distribution of this big family of statistical modeling distributions called the, you guessed it, exponential family. <laughs> you can build up all the others, starting with the exponential. And there's a, a figure in Chapter 9 about this. The gamma uh, is, you get the gamma by adding exponentials together. Uh, the gamma is also constrained to be positive real, but it also has an average magnitude of displacement, uh, in addition to an average displacement in the Gamma distribution is the second survival distribution. Lots of processes are gamma distributed in nature. For example, age of onset of disease is often gamma distributed. Um, it's a distribution you get if a bunch of things have to break before something happens. Uh, you get a gamma distribution. Uh, counts is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, the count distributions that are the workhorses in modeling are really all versions of the multinomial uh, distribution. Uh, we're going to work with the binomial and the Poisson distribution, uh, which are special cases of the multinomial. Uh, and in the book, I also talk about the geometric distribution as well. Uh, and these are also maximum entropy distributions. But when does the binomial arise? Well, I'll tell you that when we get to that example. Okay. Um, then uh, on Friday, we're going to talk about models that I call monsters. Uh, there are kinds of measures which, by the nature of them, are very inconvenient to model. Uh, but nevertheless, when you think about the way you've measured them, you can construct a generalized linear model of them. Uh, we're going to work with, so ranks, rank data is like this. Rank data is when you take some quantitative measure and then you just rank the values. So you just know the cardinal order of them. Uh, data like that is a nightmare to work with. It really is awful, but it can be done. What you want to do is just not rank things, uh, to be honest. Just go back to the original data. Don't rank. <laughs> Ranking loses information. But sometimes, you know, someone gives you rank data and tells you to analyze it. This is all you got. Uh, ordered categories is what we're going to look at on Friday because it's extremely common, at least in psychology, to work with things uh, called Likert scales or Likert scales. I don't know if anybody knows how to pronounce that name. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? 
is it Likert or Likert? Likert. Likert. Thank you. So Likert scales, uh, you don't have a more fundamental measure. You, what you elicit from the participants is some ranking from one to seven conventionally, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and then you've got to model the distribution of those responses. Lots of important things can be studied this way, um, but that variable is distributed in a highly inconvenient fashion. We will build up a model of that that works much, much better than linear regression, which is unfortunately the convention, I think, in psychology, is to analyze them using linear regression. Um, and then mixtures. Uh, also, I'll give you a taste of mixtures on Friday. These are cases where You've got a single set of measures, but multiple processes produce the lump of numbers. Uh, uh, and this will make more sense. So I'll give you examples on Friday. And so it's a mixture because it's the, the, the histogram, if you will, of values is a mixture of different processes. And you can't, you don't know which of the values is produced by which process, but you can nevertheless still model the aggregate distribution. This happens a lot in science. Um, and I'm going to give you an example um, uh, on Friday. Okay, the second step is link functions. This is actually the easiest thing, but it's a little bit weird. Uh, the linear regressions we've done so far, um, the strategy has been to take the parameter for the mean mu, and we hitch it up to our linear model. And this is easy because the outcome variable, y here, and the parameter for the mean, mu, have the same units. Whatever the measurement scale is on y, mu has the same measurement scale. Right, so if y is, uh, what, centimeters per kilogram, right, or centimeters of height, rather, centimeters of height, then uh, mu is also centimeters of height. Yeah, they're on the same measurement scale. This is the only model type like this. There is, there is almost nothing else in statistics uh, that is benign in this way. But don't get panicked. Uh, there's no problem. Uh, <laughs> no problem, right? Uh, so this means... Um, what we're going to work with today is, are, are instead binomial models, like the globe tossing model from the, the first model you met in this course, back when I was still calling models golems. Remember that time? Uh, a halcyon age at the beginning of the course when the homeworks were easy, right? <laughs> that part of the course. Um, so we're going back to that model today. And the, the thing about uh, y is now a count. And um, actually I actually have some animation for that. Y is a count. <laughs> and... Uh, what is P? It's a probability. It has no units. Probabilities are dimensionless, right? Uh, because they come from, you can think of, if you construct them from frequencies, the units divide out. They have no units on them. So now uh, we need some way to connect these things. The units on our parameters can't be counts of whatever it is we observe. Uh, it has to be dimensionless. And so we need something called a link function. Uh, that is, the, the question mark there between P and our linear model is, what happens to connect these things? What is the hitch that is going to make this work? And the um, very effective uh, approach in statistics is to use something called a link function. Uh, here, I just anonymize it, call it F for function. You're used to this, right? And uh, we have to choose those so that it scales things right, so that um, some unconstrained space of the linear model gets put on the proper space for that parameter. So in this case, the proper space for the parameter is 0, 1, because that is the do proper domain for a probability, right? The, the average probability of, of this binomial process, of each trial uh, producing a count, um, has to be bound between 0 and 1. So as I show you on this graph here, if you have some x variable on its dimension on the horizontal axis, it gets plugged into the linear model, uh, then there's some inverse function of your linear model that has to only have valid values inside the proper domain. So we have to choose this function f so that that's true. And all this hard work has been done for you. Um, and there are very good choices for these things. So this is called the link function. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how to use it when we get to the context of the model. All right, third and final step, the part that your computer does uh, for you, you do all the hard work of programming this model, and then it will happily sample from the posterior distribution for you, right? And uh, the thing about generalized linear models, though, is that um, the search through the posterior distribution is typically harder. So if you're using some optimization approach like map estimation, uh, more things can go wrong. Uh, uh, so you have to be a little bit more careful. 
Um, the interpretation of these models is harder because now the relationship between the gears in the tide prediction engine and the predictions of the tides is not as transparent. Uh, but that's okay, you've already learned how to force predictions out of your models. I made you do that back when it wasn't necessary. You're welcome, and now it's necessary. Uh, so you're already skilled at this. Um, the link functions matter, so we're going to uh, uh, think about the impact those have on inference. And um, the quadratic approximation that you were using up to this point in the course often works with GLMs, but not always. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's fantastically bad. I'm going to give you an example maybe if I get to it at the end of today's lecture, but if not, at the start of Friday. So it's really safest to rely on MCMC. Uh, you, can, you can build up steam, as it were, using map estimation, but um, the estimates you publish, uh, I would encourage you to use Markov chains, just to be sure. Because um, there's no guarantee that the posterior distribution looks anything like a multidimensional Gaussian. Uh, it could look like anything, even if all your priors are Gaussian. It could, it could be all over the place. Uh, okay, last thing to say, uh, uh, well, I'm going to want to say two things about generalized linear models, all of them, that are different than um, the models up to this point in the course. And you have to keep these in mind. You'll see examples in the, in the applied work that you do in the course. So um, the first thing is there are ceiling and floor effects on the outcomes. So for a binomial, there are both. Uh, but for Unconstrained counts like Poisson counts, there are floor effects still. So, but all of these have some boundary; they can't go below or above on the outcome space. Unlike a Gaussian, which is in principle, you know, infinite in both directions. Uh, in practice, of course, it wasn't right. Heights we modeled heights as Gaussian. Heights don't go below zero, right? But we didn't have anybody in our sample near that boundary, so we didn't worry about it. But in principle, height is not Gaussian either. If you get near zero, right? If you're one cell, you don't get shorter than one cell. Yeah, and. Uh, so the, the thing about uh, ceiling and floor effects is that they change the way parameters operate depending upon where you are in the outcome space. That is, uh, a, a change in a predictor doesn't induce the same constant change on the outcome scale. Uh, all of the predictors matter at the same time, and they affect one another. So there's not a constant impact. Um, and so one way to think about this is not a bad thing. This is necessary. You want models to do this because that's the way the world works. So think about it this way. Say you had salamanders. Um, I used to work at a university where lots of people studied salamanders, so this is why there are examples like this <laughs> in my course. Not so many salamanders in Germany yet. We should import them, but there's probably already a government agency trying to censor me for saying that. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, uh, uh, if Say we're modeling the probability salamanders survive given different spring temperatures. Um, and uh, so this is thing about uh, survival is that um, if it's really, really cold, then there may be lots of other threats to the salamander, um, which don't matter because it's going to die anyway. right? But those threats would be incredibly relevant in the middle temperature range where it's a coin flip whether it survives or not. Then, like, say, whether it gets enough food or whether predators are around, those are great predictors and things you want to control for. So the impact of some other variable, mediating variable on survival, like the presence of predators, uh, its impact will depend, will interact with the temperature uh, because you can't die twice, right? That's the basic puzzle. And that's the way biology works. So you want a model that observes this fact about how things work. And, and the same true on the other end. Eventually it gets hot enough that it doesn't matter if there are predators. You're going to burst into flames, right? Or dehydrate, as the case is with salamanders, right? Does this make sense? So this is not a bad thing about these models. It's not a reason to fall back on linear regression. It's a reason to leave linear regression behind. Uh, it's because this is the way the world actually works. Um, and so the way I talk about this is that everything interacts in generalized linear models, and everything interacts in the world if you push a system far enough towards a floor or a ceiling, because uh, remember, you can only die once, right? So uh, to think about this mathematically, with linear regression, there's this wonderful and benign fact that if you want to know the rate of change in the mean mu for a unit change in x, you take the partial derivative of mu with respect to x, and it's beta, right? The beta coefficient is the partial derivative of mu on x. It's wonderful, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Um, in logistic regression, uh, which you'll meet today, it is not like that at all. In logistic regression, uh, and I'll, I'll teach you this in the upcoming slides, it's a fact that the 
mathematical expression we're going to use for p, the probability of a success on any given trial, is this thing, which is the logistic function. <laughs> Uh, you'll notice there's a linear model in here, and it appears twice in the function in the formula. Yeah, good times. Uh, no, but this is the most rational way to set up these models. Actually, this is maximum entropy. In fact, this is a great way to set it up. And if you take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x, I, I leave this as an exercise for the student, uh, or Wolfram Alpha, if you prefer. <laughs> uh, you get this thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, what is that thing? Well, it's, it's actually a, a, a well-known uh, trigonometric function. It appears in the real world in physics. I think it's a, the path a suspended cable makes. Uh, and, but it appears that that's not what you need to know about it. What you need to know about it is that the linear model is still in there. It doesn't go away. It's still there. So no matter what that linear model is, the whole thing will appear in the rate of change of P with respect to the change in any of the predictors. The, and the reason is it's the ceiling and floor effect. Where you are uh, on the temperature range, whether it's you know really hot or really cold, affects the marginal impact of change in any of the other predictors. Right? You can only die once. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, so you, how do you solve that problem? Well, you, you, do, you plot predictions, right, at different base rates, as it were. And I'll have some examples of that in the worked in the worked examples. Um, okay. We're going to work with the binomial distribution, which is uh, if you're going to learn one type of regression in addition to Gaussian regression, it should be binomial regression. This is an extremely common sort of data, count data. Right? Anytime there are a fixed number of trials in and a number of discrete outcomes can happen in each of those trials and you count up one of those kinds of outcomes, we call them successes. Right? So this is like in our globe tossing, it was water. Right, how many waters did we count in the globe tossing? Then the data uh, um, are really well modeled as binomial. Now I say really well modeled um, because there could be correlations between trials, but if you don't have any information about those correlations, the maximum entropy distribution is binomial because the binomial will be the only distribution that actually makes no assumptions about the correlations. Anything else will put information about correlations in there that you don't actually have. Uh, so that's where that's why we use the binomial. It's not because it's true or it has to be used, is because it's the most conservative distribution you could use, given the, the pre-data constraints, the pre-observation constraints on the outcome variable. Um, so remember, in, in Chapter 9, there's a box where I talk about the maximum entropy nature of the binomial. Okay, so if, when we write these models down, just like in the conventions we've been using so far, the outcome variable here will be a count, often called the successes, but if it's deaths, then maybe you don't want to call it success. Right. It could be a mortality count. Um, so some, some sensitivity, as always, is required in describing your model. <laughs> uh, number of trials in. This is the maximum value of Y that you could ever observe. It's the number of trials, the number of individuals, number of salamanders exposed <laughs> to threat, right? Things like that. Be the population size of salamanders, and Y is the mortality count, something like that. Uh, and then P is the probability in the any of the individual trials is a quote-unquote success. Uh, yeah. So uh, interesting thing about the binomial is that like all of the distributions other than the Gaussian, the mean and the variance scale together. If you increase the average, the expectation of y, you also increase its variance. Or rather, don't increase its variance. It, it uh, it goes up first and then goes down because of the nature of the binomial. But there's a, a they vary together, um, and these are the formulas for them, which you don't need to memorize. I just put them up there to show you that they contain the same things. <laughs> so if you change in, they both change. And if you change p, they both change. This was not true of the Gaussian. In the Gaussian, we had two different parameters for the mean and the variance. They had nothing to do with one another. So you could ignore the variance, essentially. But that won't be true with any other modeling type, is that the variance scales with the mean. And again, that's good, because that's how your data behave as well. It counts have to behave this way. They absolutely have to. Uh, so if you use a model that doesn't behave this way, you're risking unnecessary error. OK, we need a link function. I've already hinted what it's going to be. Uh, we're going to do logistic regression. So y and p are in different scales. This is just to summarize what I told you before. y is a count, p is a probability. We need to model p as a function of our predictor variables, and our goal is to bound p in a 0-1 interval. 
Uh, so graphically, you can think about it this way. We've got some predictor variable x. It's on, a, on the real number line or whatever measurement scale it's been on. Um, what we're going to do is project, and that, and that um, linear model is going to live on an outcome space that we call the log odd space, and that's the y-axis on this graph. The log odd space is also continuous, centered on zero. Um, and it goes infinitely down and infinitely up. And so our linear model is linear in the log odd space. Right? What are log odds? Well, the odds are the probability something happens over the probability it doesn't happen. Those are the odds. And the log odds are the logarithm of that. <laughs> Those are the log odds. So why the log odds? And the reason is because the log odds are the fundamental parameter of a binomial distribution. Uh, again, there's, there's a box in Chapter 9 that proves this. You don't need to care about the proof. You can just take it as like the angels descended and gave you a stone tablet that said <laughs> that the log odds. But actually, it's proved in that box. It's, it, you don't have to take my word for it. Again, math is nice, unlike science, in that you can prove things. Um, so, but then we transform this log odds space onto the outcome space through the inverse function of the log odds. So you just invert the function. And this is the logistic function, what's called the logistic transform. And then it rescales. So I've taken these horizontal lines to show you the, the even packing of the log odds space. On the outcome space, it's very uneven. So extreme values end up being very close together on the probability space. Uh, values uh, around zero end up with probability one half, like a coin flip. All right, so the log odds of zero is probability one half. Uh, and Larger values in both directions give you uh, get you closer to zero in the negative direction or closer to one in the positive direction, but the space gets compacted so that the, a log odds change of one unit has a different effect on probability depending upon how far from zero you are. And you get used to this very fast um, when we're working with these models. So think about it this way. This is PI, our probability scale over there. Uh, and this is our linear model scale. They're on different measurement scales. And after you do the transformation, it, it, the linear model is not linear anymore. That's why we call these nonlinear models. Does this make sense? Uh, that's one reason to call them nonlinear models. There'd be other ways too. Okay. So, um, uh, very quickly, this is covered in the book. What does this imply about P? So, we're going to write these models like this at the top. You're going to do logit of P is equal to alpha plus beta x or whatever your linear model is. What does that mean about P? Say you want to. We have to calculate p to make predictions. Uh, well, algebra to the rescue, solve for p. Um, uh, logit of p just means the log of pi over 1 minus pi. pi over 1 minus pi is the odds, and logit means log odds. It's just a goofy word for log odds. Um, there's a, I think there's an end note in the book where I explain the history of this term. If you're interested and you have time to kill, you can look at it. Uh, so now we've got an expression we just solve for pi using your secondary school algebra, right? You remember that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you get this answer, which is the thing I showed you before. This is the logistic function. It also arises in ecology as a fundamental function of popu how populations grow under constraint. Yeah, you may have seen it before. Uh, bacteria in petri dishes grow logistically. All kinds of things grow logistically. Uh, here, that's not the justification. It arises from the from this transformation of the spaces. Um, from your perspective as an applied scientist, what you want to know is kind of reference values. And it's, it's actually very easy to work on the log odds scale and school your intuitions. So you just have to remember sort of references. A log odds of zero is a probability of a half. That's easy to remember. Think of it that way. That's your middle part of it. Log odds of zero is a probability of a half. When the linear model has a value of zero, the outcome, the expected outcome is a half. That's a coin flip, right? Uh, as you go up, a log odds of 1 is a probability of 0 0.73. 70% of the outcomes will be a success now. We've gone from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. By the time you're up to a log odds of 3, you're at 95%, 0.95. And 4 means destiny. So log odds above 4 are pressed up really tightly against the ceiling. And minus 4 is pressed up really tightly against the floor. Uh, this is an important thing to think about uh, when working with models like this, um, especially if you want to establish priors. So you think about what's a reasonable, before you see the data, a reasonable effect size. Um, a log odds of 8 is unreasonable. right? That means always, always, always. And a log odds of minus 8 means never, never, never. Uh, so a uniform prior 
on a logistic regression is madness, absolute madness, right? It'll put all of the probability maps outside any reasonable effect size. Yeah, uh, so this is very important. Uh, and if you, uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples in later lectures of the kind of madness that uniform priors would create in a logistic regression. Um, okay, uh, so this is our logit link. It looks like that. I said, where does this thing come from? I've already told you it's it's the natural link in a sense. It is actually present in the mathematics of uh, the binomial distribution. It's the fundamental parameter of the binomial distribution. And you can look at the overthinking box on pages 279 to, to 280. Um, you'll sometimes see other links uh, for the binomial models. These are, are less common um, in general, uh, even though the logit link was last to be invented of these three. Uh, the other two common ones being the probit and the complementary log log. I think complementary log log was the first. This was Fisher in the 20s, used it uh, in a toxicology experiment, I think it was. I'm hazy on this. This was graduate education for me, which was last century. Uh, so I've forgotten <laughs> these things. But um, it's still used in toxicology uh, fairly often, I think, for historical reasons. And the probit model, um, uh, which is the probit is the cumulative normal, uh, it's the probit distribution. Uh, the logit is named after it, <laughs> All right, so it rhymes with it. The logit came last, but it has a lot of mathematical advantages compared to these two, and so it's much more common in applied statistics. Uh, the probit is still common in economics, where I think it, it for, again, for historical reasons. Okay, let's actually do some data analysis now, which is why you're actually taking this class. Yeah, so I'm going to use a, the most famous binomial regression that I know of. This is a very common teaching example, and because it has a lot of, it's both real and it has, it illustrates many important things about applied statistics. These data are built into the rethinking package, of course, called UCB admit. These are data from 1973 uh, PhD program applications and acceptance rates uh, at um, six different programs at UC Berkeley. These were the largest departments in 1973. Largest departments now are different. <laughs> but in 1973, these were them. The departments have been anonymized to protect the innocent, uh, but you will be able to guess probably <laughs> uh, which programs are which in some vague sense. Um, I've just called them A through whatever the sixth letter of the alphabet is. And uh, the question, uh, the reason this is a famous historical example is the dean, one particular dean, again, whose name shall be held in, anonymously <laughs> to protect the innocent, was worried. Now, this isn't a bad story. Uh, was worried that they might get sued uh, for gender discrimination because in the 70s in the U.S., institutions were getting sued uh, for gender discrimination. It was a, a new time, <laughs> a brave new world. And so institutions were worried about this. And there was an honest dean who was like, okay, we should look closely at our processes and tell. So to the rescue, he called the stats department. <laughs> it's probably the first and last time a dean has ever called the stats department for help. No, I joke. I don't know. Um, and when I, actually, when I was at Davis, the dean called me for help to do statistics analysis on things. So maybe deans do this a lot. Uh, but uh, So we're going to look at these data and retrace the steps of the statisticians in trying to figure out if there was evidence of gender discrimination in graduate admissions in 1973 at UC Berkeley. Uh, here's what the data look like. You can look at this is all the data uh, right here on your screen. There are 12 rows, two rows for each department. So department A is the first two rows. Um, then we have an applicant gender column. Uh, we've grouped together all of the male applications on the first row. There were 825, if you look on the far right. 512 of them were admitted. 313 were rejected. Second row is female applications to the same department. There were 108 applications, 89 admitted, 19 rejected. And so on down through them all. These are counts. These are not Gaussianly distributed variables. Uh, our goal is to model something you can't see in this table, and that is the probability of admission conditional upon gender of the applicant. Make sense? This is a binomial regression. It's the Ur binomial regression. <laughs> uh, it describes the whole method of what you want to do. All right. Uh, here's what it looks like. Um, this is our, our model. The mathematical version is in the lower right. The number of admit, uh, the number admitted on each row i is distributed binomially, with a possible number of successes in sub i. Um, and I show you in the code what does that mean? It's the number of applications. It's the number of trials, right? Each each application is a trial, and there's some process which admits or rejects that. It's a committee, yeah. At least it used to be a committee. Now maybe a computer. I actually don't know. 
uh, how these things work now at Berkeley. And, um, and then there's a probability on each row i uh, that each trial is admitted or not. And we're going to model that as a linear model with some intercept alpha, logit link to a linear model, intercept alpha, and then a coefficient beta m times m sub i, where m sub i is uh, whether the, the application is male or not. It's a dummy variable, zero one-coded dummy variable. Yeah? You with me? Okay. And then some uh, priors, um, uh, which I will talk about on Friday. I will we'll loop back to this, and I'll talk about simulating priors, uh, prior predictions from this model. But I want to try to keep it as simple as possible today. Okay. Uh, so we're going to fit this. The code makes sense. Yeah. I'm using map, but map to stand code looks the same, except you add to stand uh, on the top part up there. And it works the same way. Okay. And I encourage you to, to run it both ways and compare. Look at the Markov chain samples, compare it to the map estimation. And think about it. In this case, they're very, very similar. Yeah. But that's not always true. But in this case, they are. Um, we're going to fit two models. We're going to fit a model that has the male dummy variable. That's the top one, model 10.6. And then we're going to fit one that just has the intercept, model 10.7, right? Where alpha is the average log odds of admission across departments. Yeah? So if it's zero, then it's a coin flip whether an individual gets admitted. Yeah. Okay. What happens? Uh, here's the model comparison using WAIC. Um, the model... Model 10.6, which remember is the model that has the male dummy variable, it, there's a lot of evidence it's better. It gets all of the Akaike weight. Yeah, the difference in in um, WASE is 90 units, right? Pretty big, and the standard error on that is big. The standard error of the difference is about 20. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty of exactly how good our predictions would be on the next class that <laughs> of, of applications, next year's applications. That's the way you want, might want to think about that. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot of evidence that having um, the male dummy variable in the model uh, improves prediction. So you can see that maybe better on the graph, right, how far apart they are on this. Okay, let's look at the predictions. Uh, uh, that's important, too. Well, okay, first, yeah, proportional change in odds. Let's think about interpreting um, these uh, uh, parameter estimates. And remember the tide prediction engine. Um, but we're going we're gonna to stick on this issue for a few slides now. Uh, I think there's some added value here. Uh, it's very common in, in binomial models with logit links to interpret the coefficients, the slope parameters, like, the, like beta sub m here, by exponentiating them. And when you do this, you take them off the log scale, and they're on the odds scale again. And this is called the proportional odds adjustment. So, And this is not silly. Uh, uh, but I want to talk you through this to help you understand that there are pitfalls in inference from this, because now you're gazing at the gears of the tide prediction engine. Um, and there are still ceiling and floor effects. So you're not getting an, un an unbiased estimate of what's going on in the actual system. So in this case, the um, map value of BM is 0.61, right? And here's its 80% per interval, right? 80 or 89% interval, sorry, from 0.51 to 0.71. Uh, if we exponentiate that, it's 1.84. That is the proportional odds. That means whatever the odds of an application being admitted were before uh, of a female application are, a male application has 1.84 times those odds. I'll say that again. Whatever the odds of a female application getting admitted to a graduate program are, a male application has 1.84 times those odds, or 184% the odds of being admitted which is higher. Yeah? Yeah? In 1973 at UC Berkeley, across all these departments. Yes? Um, so the thing about this estimate is this is a relative estimate. This is what's called a relative effect size. And bear with me for a few slides now as I riff through my rant about relative effect sizes. Um, is that uh, relative effect sizes can sound a lot bigger than they are on the outcome scale. So when it's, you say 184%, that's, that's larger, so that's bad. That sounds like policy intervention is required here, right? That's the first thing to say. But how much of an advantage is that? And you really can't tell because remember the ceiling and floor effect. Alpha matters. Where alpha is will affect the actual impact of that beta coefficient. Whether you're, if almost everybody's getting admitted anyway, then it doesn't matter. 
right? Because you're all already against the ceiling. If almost no one's getting admitted, it doesn't matter very much either, because you're you're basically you know everybody's dying already. <laughs> Most hardly any applications filter through anyway, and so it's not a big advantage. Or if you're in, but if alpha's in the middle, so that lots of applications are accepted and lots are rejected, then it can be a huge advantage to be male in this pool. Does that make sense? Okay, so we we. That's called the distinction between, or at least I call it, the distinction between relative and absolute effects. Uh, now I tell you this in the parable of relative shark and absolute deer. Uh, I help you remember this. So think about relative shark and absolute deer. I'll explain why these animals in a moment. Relative shark is the slide we just did. Relative shark exponentiates the beta coefficients inside the linear model of a logistic regression and then publishes that number uh, as saying this is the effect. Um, and then it's really hard for you to interpret what's going on. Yeah, because of the ceiling and floor effects. Uh, relative effects tend to exaggerate the importance of a predictor. Uh, in this case, I don't think they do. Uh, I'll show you the absolute effect in a moment, and you can judge for yourself. But there are lots of cases, uh, famous cases in applied statistics, where quoting the relative risk um, uh, greatly exaggerates the absolute risk. So this is really good for scaring people in the public health literature. Why, if you have a really rare disease, you're pushed up against the floor, and the relative risk could be huge. It could be 300%. You could have uh, 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 exponentiate the coefficient and get a value of 3. So you have three times um, the proportional odds of, of contracting the disease. Uh, but if almost nobody in the population gets the disease, it still doesn't matter to you, and you should still conduct your day the same way. right? Uh, this is like the risk of being the victim of a terrorist attack in a country like this one. Right? It's, it's, that's the last thing you should be worrying about. You should be worrying about cars. That's what you should be worrying about. <laughs> right? Cars. Number one killer. Cars. <laughs> and that's what you should be worrying about. Um, so sorry, but this is a common problem, right? So we worry about this, and that's why you want to calculate both. The relative risk, relative shark, and absolute deer. Um, we need both of them. We still need relative shark because for causal inference and prediction outside of domain, you actually want the coefficient, right? You need to plug that in, and then you could change the other parameters, too, and make inferences outside of context. Uh, where does absolute deer come from? Absolute deer comes from, because absolute deer are like cars, uh, but they're animals, right? In the sense that deer kill many more people per year, uh, at least in places, high latitude places where deer live, uh, than sharks do. Why? Uh, because there are a lot more deer, and they're terrestrial, like people. <laughs> so there's an exposure that goes on here, and deer are actually much more dangerous um, if you're going to be worried about death from an animal, I mean, you should worry a lot more about deer than sharks. And this is why I say it's absolute deer. Now, the deer is the absolute threat. The shark is a relative threat. What do I mean? If you're in the water, sharks are a lot more dangerous than deer. Yeah? I worked really hard on this metaphor. And I hope you guys enjoy it. I was trying to help you remember this distinction. And it's important. So remember this slide. Absolute deer, relative shark. Sharks kill five people annually. Um, I should have gone with absolute hippo, maybe, but I thought maybe that was stretching it a bit too far. Hippos are really dangerous. Uh, having worked in Africa myself, I can tell you that they are not joking around. Um, so uh, risk communication. Uh, this is a famous example of this problem, uh, where if you all you report is a relative risk, you can wildly mislead people about the absolute risk. So uh, here's a, an example. You can always rely upon the Daily Mail to do things wrong. Uh, so if you guys know this newspaper. Uh, so the Daily Mail um, did a lot of damage by uh, reporting relative risk uh, of a particular study uh, in Great Britain. So uh, it turns out that one in a thousand women who are on um, conventional birth control pills, the, the standard kind, two kinds of hormones, right, people take monthly, uh, one in a thousand women uh, who aren't on the pill will develop blood clots that are potentially fatal. Typically, they, they happen in the lower leg. You may have heard about these things. And uh, three out of a thousand women on birth control develop these blood clots. Uh, it's rare. These blood clots are extremely rare in the general adult population, but they're a lot more common if you're on birth control. And there are reasons for this, actually. It is causal. The link here is causal in this case. Uh, so this is the relative risk is a 200% increase in blood clots. That's what the Daily Mail reported. Uh, this was on the news. It was all over the newsstands. Lots of women stopped taking birth control. And then they got pregnant, and it turns out that that's a lot more dangerous. Uh, <laughs> so many of you are thinking, so I shouldn't say things like that. You should have children. They're wonderful. <laughs> My son is the best thing that ever happened to me. But, <laughs> but I didn't have to gestate him, right? So easy for me to say. <laughs> but uh, no, so jokes about pregnancy aside, pregnancy is medically much more dangerous 
than being on birth control. And so there was a much greater loss of mortality as a consequence of people going off birth control uh, than staying on it here, despite the 200% uh, uh, increase um, in risk of these blood clots. Uh, but the, the relative risk misleads because the, on the absolute scale, the change in probability between two categories is 0 0.002 because you're looking at an increase of two women out of a thousand, right? So that's the 0 0.002. That's the absolute, that's absolute deer. Relative shark is 200%. Absolute deer is 0 0.002. This is the last thing you should worry about, right? You should be worrying about fish and chips and what it does to your heart. So you should be worrying about uh, in this population. Okay. Um, that aside, that's a, that's a real historical example. Uh, so um, how do we get absolute predictions in this example, in the UC Berkeley data? Uh, you just push the predictions out of the model, uh, just like you've been doing so far. So again, this is just looking at uh, the internal states of the machine. And let's take the map values now. Of course, we need the full distribution for predictions, but if you just you can just take the map value and understand what's going on. You just apply the, the inverse link function, which in this case is called logistic. And that's that formula, which has an exponential on the top and the bottom. That's, that's the logistic function. And it puts the linear model on the, on the probability scale. The logistic function takes a continuous range of values and puts them in a 0, 1 interval in a particular way that's right for our modeling. Uh, so logistic of just the intercept gives you the prediction for an average male ap application. And logistic... Uh, the intercept plus the coefficient gives you the prediction for an average female application. Yeah, and now we're on the probability scale. We have absolute predictions. And those are 0.3 and 0.45, just about, right? So now the difference in probability is 15%. Make sense? So you see there's added value. This is interpretable, right? And you understand the advantage now. It's a 15% increase. Um, lots of both are getting admitted. Uh, uh, but a lot more male applications, right? 15% more. Um, so we want the uncertainties. Uh, I'm going to go fast through this, but this is in the book. We calculate the posterior distribution of these effects uh, by just putting all the samples into the logistic function here, exactly as you see. Put all the samples in post, and then you have the post object inside the logistic function. Works the same as before. Now you get distributions, uh, posterior distributions of predictions, as we always want. And we can plot them. And then relative shark on the left, the odds ratio uh, for a male application, you can see it's centered around a little over 1.8, right? Um, but between 1.6 and uh, 2.1 about. And then absolute deer on the right, the difference in probability between a male application and a female application centered on 0.14, but it's uh, uh, always positive, right? Greater than, the advantage is always uh, uh, greater than 0.1 but less than uh, 0.17, about 0.18. Make sense? You want to compute both. Okay. You will not leave with this sad story. Uh, you will leave with a, a better story. Um, now, you should always look at the posterior predictions against the data. You want to know if, how, how the model fits badly, because all models fit badly in some way. Why? Because you don't want to overfit, right? You could put in a parameter for every department, and then you fit the data perfectly. That's not our goal. Uh, so let's look at the posterior predictions. So this is the output of the post-check function in rethinking, which is the dumb automated way to, to compute posterior predictions. It just uses link, uses the link function. It takes each case in the data set and then makes a plot like this. Um, so now what we're looking at is each case in the data set along the bottom. So this is department A, our cases one and two, cases three and four, department B, and so on. Make sense? And each column is a particular combination of department and gender of applicants. And then on the vertical, we have the outcome scale of P, the P parameter, the probability of admission of each application. Uh, the model predictions are the open circles, and the pluses on above them are the prediction intervals. Right? This is what comes out of link if you use the link function in rethinking. This is what you get. It's what we just computed on the previous slide, actually. <laughs> uh, absolute deer. This is absolute deer. And then the blue points with the lines between them are the actual data. The proportions in the actual data. This is a really terrible model. Uh, it misses every department, absolutely every department, um, right? And even more interesting than that, you'll notice that there are only two departments, departments C and E, uh, where female applicants have a lower rate of admission than males. And all the <laughs> others, female applic applicants are rated, admitted at a higher rate than the males. 
You see that? Because the bars are going up, <laughs> right? Yeah? Uh, what has gone wrong here, uh, right? You see the models are always predicting down. It's predicting that the second one in each case, right? Because the model thinks that the female applications have a lower admission rate. It's a terrible model. This is why you check your predictions, right? Don't publish this model. Uh, <laughs> right. So what's going on here? Um, the overall admission rates vary a lot across departments. You can see that on this slide, right? All over the place. Not all departments are equal in their, their admission rates. Some are extremely selective and some less so. Some get a lot of applications and so they accept less of them. And some get very few applications and they accept more of their pool. Uh, you know, this is graduate programs vary uh, in that way. We dumped them all together like they're the same in their average admission rates and assign them the same alpha. Let's fix that problem, right? Because that is the problem here, as you'll see. So let's create a unique intercept for each department so that we're going to say each department can have its own average admissions rate, but now we're going to estimate the average difference between males and females in each department. So I'm going to let departments have different base rates of admission. So that means we have to give them different intercepts. So this is the model to do that. We make subscripts. We like to make subscripts and stats right all over the place. Uh, and so now we make alpha conditional on department. So for each department on row i, there's an index uh, for the department now between 1 and 6. And you get an alpha vector of alpha parameters from 1 to 6. This is We did this. I didn't do it in lecture, but this is at the end of chapter 5 when you do categorical variables. Uh, way to think about it is now there's just a different alpha for every department, and we're going to estimate it with the data from that department. Um, and uh, in plain English, you can think about this as um, in the previous model we did on the left, this model is asking the question, what are the average probabilities of admission for females and males across all departments? Yeah, because there's nothing about departments inside the model at all. It ignores departments. It just pools all the applications in a giant heap and treats them the same. So across all departments, ignoring departments, what are the average probabilities of admissions of males and females? And the model successfully answered that question. It did not lie to you. But you actually wanted to ask a different question, I, I assert. <laughs> or I tricked you into pretending for a moment you were answering a different question is what I did. It's actually my fault. But... Uh, 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 the question we want to answer is instead, what is the average difference in probability of admission for females and males within departments? And that's what the model on the right uh, uh, answers. Because for each department, we get uh, a rate of admission alpha. And then we have the average difference, beta sub m, which doesn't depend upon department. That's why it's an average difference. It's the average difference across departments. But it's the difference between the two, between males and females. Now it's within departments because each department gets a different level that it starts from. You with me? Yeah. So um, way to think about what's going on with this in the code is now the, you'll see there's A inside the model and it's bracketed with department ID. What's department ID? It's a new variable we make. And I show it on the left here for each department it has a name, A through F. Um, we just give it an index number, one through six. So now there's a vector of alphas of just six parameters and we just get the right one for each department. This is the way you construct it. So what MAP and map to stand will do is it looks at department ID, sees that it has their six unique values in it, so it makes a vector of parameters called A, and they have positions one through six, and it estimates each of them using the data from each department. And again, this is at the end of chapter five when I talk about categorical variables. So, and then now, two new models. There's the model at the top, 10.8, which ignores, has unique base rates of admission for each department, but ignores uh, the gender of the applicant. And then 10.9, which has both. It has unique intercepts for each department and the presence of gender for the applicant. Let's do the tournament again. Right? Suspense, foreshadowing. Right. Uh, and what happens? 10.8 um, is the winner now. Well, first of all, you should see 10.8 and 10.9 beat the pants off of 10.6 uh, uh, and 10.7. Yeah, it's, it's no contest. Look at the difference in WAIC. And that's because most of the variation in this data set in the, the, if there was one thing you wanted to know that would help you predict the chances of an application, it should be department. It's the most important piece of information. Everything else is just mopping up the little trivial bits of probability here. The most important fact is which department you apply to because the differences in average admission rates between departments are huge. They cover the whole range. 
uh, of possibilities, as you saw in the previous graph. And that, so that's why 10.8 and 10.9 do so much better. Uh, that's the reason. But it still may be that there's a gender effect, right? And that's what we're looking at uh, in this case. Uh, and in that case, you'll see that the top two models, remember 10.8 doesn't have male, the male dummy variable in it, 10.9 does. And you'll notice they're tied. Right? They have about tied AKIK okay, weight. They're, you can't tell the difference between these two models. They do about equally well. Um, I would encourage you to read that as uh, the gender of the applicant matters, um, but it's probably overfit a little bit in the model that has it. Yeah? That's the way I encourage you to read ties like this. It's not that you want to say the gender of application doesn't matter. It's just that it doesn't matter a huge amount and it's probably overfit a little bit. But the evidence here is that it matters. Just not a lot. Yeah? So it, it's a tie between the two. Remember, AIC and then WAIC and their kin, they just measure overfitting. They don't tell you what the truth is here because there are priors in these models. Yeah? So it's probably true that the, in model 10.9, we want to look at the predictions now and see what it says. Um, so we can do that. Uh, when you look at the Precy output for 10.9, you'll notice now that there's a vector of A's, one for each department. Right? I told you, A1 is department A, department B, and down. And these are their average rates. And you'll see they go all the way from log odds 0.68, which is very positive. Most of the, this department accepts most of its applicants. I think it's physics, actually, in the real data. And they get very few applicants, and they accept most of them. And at least in 73 they did. I don't know what it's like now. And then you go down. Uh, this was engineering, I think. <laughs> uh, and then we get into negative zone. We get into the selective departments, which are social sciences and humanities. Social sciences and humanities receive way more applications and accept way fewer of them. We get all the way down to minus 2.6. Remember, minus 3 is 5% chance of, of acceptance. Yeah? Get good at reading log odds. You'll dream in log odds before long. <laughs> Get really good at it. It's a very natural scale. Uh, people quote probabilities to me. I immediately convert them to log odds scale. I do. It's just like a tick. <laughs> uh, they're good to add. You can reason with them. You can do math fast with them. Okay. BM is the target of our ire. Uh, it's minus 0.1. Um, and a standard deviation of 0 0.08, but most of it's below zero. Right? So what does that mean? Males are slightly disadvantaged on average now. Male applications are very slightly disadvantaged on average within departments. Across departments in general, male applicants are hugely advantaged, but it's because of the departments they apply to. The departments they apply to tend to accept most applications. Does this make sense? This is why this is a famous data set. It's fun to think with, right? Uh, so here's what the predictions look like. Um, with male dummy variables on the top, you'll see now the model's doing a much better job. It actually touches the data now, <laughs> right? It doesn't get all the variation. Uh, we don't want it to. We don't want to overfit. Um, we want to measure the effects we're interested in. And then uh, the previous model on the bottom, so you can compare. Bad model on the bottom, uh, better model on the top that at least gets the order of predictions right. Um, so yeah, the department A, I think, was physics. I forget. It was physics or, or mechanical engineering. And uh, uh, that's the one where there's a huge advantage um, for being a female applicant in that department, but they had very few, and they accepted nearly all of them. They were probably, you know, the, there are selection effects about who applies to these things, so they're not, the applicants aren't all anonymously the same. Uh, that's why these data analysis of these cases is so complicated. Okay, that's um, all the time we have for today. We're going to pick up uh, with explaining this on Friday. Uh, this is an example of a famous thing in stats called Simpson's Paradox, and I will leave the explanation of the generality of this phenomenon until Friday morning. Uh, thank you all for your indulgence, and I'll see you then.